Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you this morning in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's start off in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for bringing us here this morning and the opportunity to just be in your house, praising you and worshiping you for your goodness. Heavenly Father, we know that in this world today there is so much chaos, there's so much discord, tension, illness, pain. Father, life can be a struggle at times. Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to just reach into all of our hearts and all the areas where we struggle. All the areas, Father, that life and turmoil of life are just getting us down and fill us with your Holy Spirit, to fill us with that joy and that hope and that love given to us through your grace that you showed to us with your Son, Jesus, on the cross. May we delight then, Father, in what you have done for us, in your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. For that we thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, kind of a, a couple quick announcements to make, by the way. Next week, outdoor service again, um, 11 a.m. That's the time we're going to try, obviously, weather permitting. If it's bad weather, we'll be in here. And then we're going to have a big picnic afterwards. Uh, kids will be running around being crazy. That's mostly referencing myself. Um, just so plan on that. It's just always nice to do it. Susie had written in here. She's like, it's our final outdoor service for the summer. Because summer's over. I hope we can get one in the fall because it's so nice in the fall, isn't it? And especially the funny part of the fall one is when we do it and I'm up on the hill and it's in the sun and warm and then those of you sitting down there when the trees start bringing shade over you and you're sitting there doing this, it's the funniest thing ever to watch. <laughs> Uh, Sunday school going to be starting up in September 12th, and also Jan is hoping to start up a um, uh, an evening knitting class. And so I'll talk to Jan about that if interested in all of that. So um, what's going to be different today is Nancy and Chris are gone, so I reached out to Kyle Hooper and said, "Would you mind leading us in some uh, our hymns this morning?" So Kyle is going to come up and do our hymns, our opening hymn for this morning that Kyle's going to come up and do. <laughs> <laughs> Our opening hymn is great, are you, Lord? Thank you, Kyle. Morning.
Friends, let us join together now as we go before our Lord, confessing to him our sins, but as always just relying upon his grace and his mercy, and the assurance of forgiveness of our sins through faith in Christ. Let us together confess. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning to ask for your forgiveness. We have sinned against you and against ourselves and need your cleansing. We have tried to do what is right, but have not been able to keep our way pure. We know that we are to put to death the deeds of the flesh, yet the old nature dies hard. We need your tender touch and your cleansing grace to help us to stand in your presence again. Thank you for your forgiveness and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given His only Son to die for us, and for His sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on His name, He gives power to become children of God and has promised them His Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of this day that you have given to us. God, for the opportunity to gather in this place together freely. And Lord, as we do so, Lord, my heart is drawn to those who do not have that freedom this morning. And I want to pray specifically for our brothers and sisters in the country of Afghanistan, Jesus. As word has come out that there are people who are going around door to door trying to find the believers there. Um, God, we know you are able to blind the eyes of those who are searching. We know you're able to intervene in miraculous ways. And if that would bring you glory, Father, we ask that in your name. But Lord, we also know that through persecution and through blood of the saints, God, you use to grow your church. You're not um, deaf to the cries of your children. And we thank you that you are just, and we pray, Lord, for your mercy. We also pray for the country of Haiti, God, and everything that's going on there. Lord, so much pain and turmoil in this world. And it's easy to um, go throughout our days and, and to forget just all the stuff that's going on in the world around us. So help us to have our eyes that are beyond our own lives. And Lord, that we'd have compassion in the lives of those around us. We pray for our neighbors, Jesus, the ones that are um, across the world, across the country, and the ones that are right across our yard as well. Help us to have a burden for them, uh, Lord, to be a good witness for your glory and your name, and Father, to be willing to be the messengers of hope that would communicate the gospel to them. God, we pray that you would do a revival in our land, and may it start with us. Lord Jesus, help open our hearts to hear your word this morning as we read and may your spirit be working through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please rise in honor of God's word this morning. Our Old Testament reading is going to be from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 16 through verse 20. Reading in Jesus' name. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people. The gospel reading is from John chapter 14. Verses 15 through 31. Again, reading in Jesus' name. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither seeks him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. 
Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am with you, still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Here ends the reading of God's word. And now will you join me in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. in our next song, You Are My King.
Let's please join me in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, let us honor you in all that we do. Father, for you are our King, a King that would come and die for us, for our sins, for our wrongdoings against you. And yet, Father, through your great grace and love and mercy, you have paid a price that we deserve to pay. Father, let the knowledge and faith in that transform us to live lives, Lord, that are filled with joy and hope in serving you, in praising you and thanking you for your goodness. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It was great that Jordan mentioned that in prayer as well because with the recent news, you almost can't help but wonder, was that 20 years down the drain? Like for 20 years, America has been involved in what was known as the Forever War. We've been trying to help establish a government and all the stuff in Afghanistan. And what, in a span of weeks, the entire thing crumbles down. And of course, anytime a monumental failure happens, People always start looking for somebody to blame. The political finger pointing has already begun. Scapegoats are gonna take the hits for this because as people, that's how we do things. But then again, that shouldn't surprise any of us that this would happen because this is what happens when we place our hope in any kind of a system or an institution built by human hands. Like Afghanistan throughout history will probably be viewed as a catastrophic failure for all the work and energy and money and time put into it to have it fall that fast. But ultimately that would have happened regardless. All institutions will fail at one point or another because they're run by people who are fallen, broken creatures. At some time later in history, everything will fall. But as believers, that's why we are called to focus on the kingdom of God and kingdom work. God's kingdom is a forever kingdom. It is a kingdom, by the way, that all of us are already citizens of, and it's a kingdom we are called to be building up for the glory of our king. So we can look at the failures that happened in Afghanistan on, a, on an earthly human level, but kingdom work is still happening there. I want to share with you some excerpts I took from an article I was reading on this in Christianity Today that came out last week. According to a recent report from the U.S. Agency of International Development, there are about 140 non-government charity organizations, many of them Christian, doing aid work in Afghanistan. They are providing food, medical care, education, tools, and seeds for farmers. They are encouraging music, art, literature, and sports. In the midst of war and conflict, they have encouraged community and civil society. We can learn something from that part, huh? As the U.S. military is pulled out of the country, foreign aid workers, of course, are now preparing themselves for a change in this political structure in Afghanistan. Christian aid workers who have been seeing a rise of violence targeting humanitarian groups in the past few years are concerned about their uncertain future, but yet, they also say they are doing work that did not begin with the U.S. invasion and will not end with the U.S. withdrawal. They say they were doing something different than the military. To quote one worker, we want people to know that God loves them and love has to be practical and physical. In the near future, many workers, of course, will be leaving because of security concerns, but others will find a way to stay. Said aid worker Anna Hampton, there is a 100-year modern history of the Christian foreigner in Afghanistan. It'll get small, but it'll be there. The motive, according to Hampton, is simple. She says, we love Jesus and we love the Afghan people. And it doesn't mean there's not going to be dangers. In the last 20 years over in Afghanistan, aid workers have experienced a lot of risks. They and their families every day have to make careful, calculated decisions about how much they want to expose themselves when they go out and how vulnerable they want to make themselves as they serve this community. Anne Hampton, Anna Hampton, for example, we just talked about her home was once broken into by armed men. She had a close family friend who was kidnapped and murdered. They were forced to evacuate the country. She says she still deals with the trauma from that attack on her family, but yet views this peril as an opportunity to live out her faith. 
And so now with the US troops gone and the Taliban firmly in control, it, it takes our mind off the fact that, you know what? The church was at work there long before our war there began. And they are determined to make sure that the work stays there no matter what it looks like, no matter how it's seen long after the war has ended. And so friends, we have to ask ourselves this, right? What would compel somebody to go to one of the most difficult regions in the world, to go into this region that's difficult to be in where you don't know the culture, you don't know the language, and you are a minority among minorities, in Afghanistan, 0.3% of people, not 3% even, 0.3% of people are of a minor, a minority religious group. Not 0.3% are Christians, 0.3% are a minority religion group. So what percentage, how small is that percentage of people there that are Christians? You're not even going into a country that has like your type of people around it. And on top of that, you have to fear for your life every day. What would compel someone to do that? We're going to talk about that today as we wrap up our series this summer, The Learning from Luther. And we're going to wrap up, we've been talking about the last few weeks, on the three different types of works that are described that Paul wrote about in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. So with that, friends, I would invite you to please rise now for the reading of our sermon text. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Since our scripture reading, you may be seated. There are three types of works listed there. The first one being the, the work that you think that you have done where you could never, ever possibly earn God's grace or be worthy of God's love. Paul writes there, for by grace you are saved, through faith. God's grace towards you. God's undeserved grace towards you. It is a gift that he has given you, not because you're awesome and deserve it, but because he's awesome and he freely gives it to you that you can be saved. None of us are worthy to receive that gift at all, but he gives it to us regardless. And it's a gift then that we receive through our faith in Jesus. Next then is the type of work Paul talks about where we think that we have to do the work and worse yet, that we have earned anything from God. Because Paul goes on to say, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Like if you're thinking God got a bargain when he landed you, think again. You are no better than anyone else because just like everyone else, we are all equally sinful. Like you can look at those people all you want, but God does not want your pride. He wants your humility. God wants you to realize that, yes, you too have fallen short of his glory, and thus you need a Savior. He wants you to be equally grateful for his grace that was extended to you and everyone else. So right now, there's this picture that works are bad. So what are we to make of works then as a Christian? Because if we can't earn God's grace through works, what's the point of doing it all? And in this series, we're going to talk about works because I said we're talking about Luther and Luther, who was known to be incredibly critical of works, especially works where you thought you were earning something from God. He spent almost his entire career going after that type of teaching. But yet Luther also teaches extensively on the need for works. So this morning, I'm going to cover a couple different sections from, from the gospel. First part we're going to talk about was our gospel reading this morning from Luke 14. But then later, as we get into some of the things that Luther wrote about from works, he's going to reference Luke 18 and the parable there, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But in this, you can understand then what works mean for us as Christians and how they are an essential aspect of our faith. So in our gospel reading, Jesus said this in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Friends, there's two ways you can read that text. 
and I'm not going to deny that I'm also guilty of saying this text the wrong way. It is easy for us sometimes to stand up and tell others, this is what you are supposed to do. This is what God expects of you. And what we're doing is we are suddenly turning it into a work that somebody's have to do. It's like, you have to do this for God. Jesus is not saying this as a commandment. He's not saying this as law. Yes, it's Jesus, so he can say what he wants and it becomes law, but he's not saying this as a law type of statement. Jesus is not saying, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. The emphasis here is not on the will. Instead, hear how much John 14, 15 changes if you put the emphasis on the word if instead of will. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. The emphasis is, if you truly love Jesus, then you will keep his commandments. It's not a will that you have to, if you love Jesus. So if you're saying, yes, I love Jesus, then the other part is what should follow. The will, the uh, you will keep my commandments is not what's driving you. It is your love for Jesus that is compelling you to follow all that he has taught you throughout Scripture. I want you to think about this way. This might be an illustration that helps. If you have a, uh, if you have a great relationship with your spouse, well, I've talked to some of you. I don't know. I know Guy and Diane's little kerfuffle lately. It's like, ooh, that one's awkward. So maybe that's a bad example, right? I'll tell you what. If you have someone in your life that you have loved throughout your life with all of your hearts, be it a, a friend or a spouse or a parent, whatever, that person that you have truly loved, Think about how they changed you and how you changed for them. Like how you would do anything for that person. And you never did it to win their love or affection. You did it because you truly loved them and it brought you great joy to serve them. Now apply that to the God of the universe. A God who, by the way, deserves nothing but our complete obedience and adoration. But God doesn't sit on his dictator throne expecting that. God sits on a throne of grace. God loves us. God cares for us. And amazingly, he died for us. That's why Romans 2.4 says that it's the kindness of God that's supposed to lead us to repentance. We don't repent because we have to. We do it because God is so good we want to. Like when you recognize all the great things that God has done for you, your response to God should not be based on anything but this joyful, grateful heart that just says, God, thank you for everything. That's why Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. It is our love for him that gives us that desire to serve the Lord. So how do we do this though, right? That's the thing. This isn't something you do. Jesus goes on to say in, in John 14, 23 and 24. Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. Like, do you get that? You keep God's word because God is in you, feeding you his word and this desire to live for him. If you're not living that way, what does he say? Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. That's a scary divide right there. If you love God, you keep his words in you and you live his commands, not because you have to, because you want to. It's him in you. That's why Jesus later on in this text promised to us the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who draws us closer to God. Into who, who fills our hearts with the desire to say, God, as a child of yours, I want to live like a child of yours. That's why scripture calls us what we're described as being born again. We are supposed to be a new creation. We are putting to death that old self. Like our Old Testament reading that we got to right there, this was God's plan of restoration for his nation. It's his plan of restoration, how he sees all his people. And what does he say? Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Put aside the old you. He says, behold, I am doing a new thing. You are that new thing. You are that new creation. So all that old stuff that we're not supposed to be, that shouldn't be you anymore. 
Why do we live as the old if God has made us new? So how do we get to this point then? How do we get to this point where we are this new creature then? Friends, we have to get to the point where it transforms us through faith. When our faith truly understands what it is that we believe. For it is by grace you are saved through faith. That faith that understands that God's grace comes first. It's that faith that understands what God has done for us. So Luther's going to break this down. I want to get into what he talked about because it's just, I, I thought his writings were so magnificent in this section here. It was this, this Luther for the Busy Man sermon series or uh, devotional series that I've been reading through. And this last week was just magnificent. And he covers Luke 18 and this, and in, in uh, Luke 18, he talks about this, this parable of a tax collector and a Pharisee. And he describes it how this, this Pharisee, you know, these really quote unquote godly people, see God, look at how good I am. And tax collectors, of course, back then were the scum of the earth. And he talks about how basically the most holy of holy and the scum of the earth both go into the temple to pray. And the, and the Pharisee stands up, does a lot of this, and he says, God, you're lucky you have me. That's not a direct quote, but let's put it this way. He uses the word I five times in two sentences. Who is that prayer really towards? God, thank you that I'm not like this, that I am this way. He's listing all the great stuff. He's telling God how good he is. Remember, Jesus says there is none good but God. But he stands before God saying, look at how good I am. And then Jesus says there's a tax collector that won't even come near the altar. He stands off in the distance. He won't even look up at all. His eyes are down and he beats at his breast and he cries out, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's all he says. Because he realizes his broken condition. Do you know how Jesus described that man? Luke 18, 14, Jesus described that tax collector this way. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Boy, the one that was all puffed up, God, aren't I great, did not go down to his house justified before God. Because this is what God wants. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. It's the faith of that tax collector, that faith to realize how broken he is before God. And this is what Luther talks about this. If faith is as it should be, it will break out and produce fruits. If the tree is green and good, there is no coming to a standstill. It must sprout and produce fruit and leaves. Nature sees to this. I don't have to go to a tree and command it and say, listen to me, tree, produce apples. If the tree is there and it is a good tree, fruit comes of its own accord. If true faith exists anywhere, works must follow. That's not a must like it has to. He's just saying it should. If I confess myself to be a sinner, it follows that I must also say, Dear God, I am a rogue. You can tell us for 500 years ago, we don't really use rogue much. It's not a good thing, by the way. Dear God, I am a rogue. Make me godly. So also the tax collector here does not hold back, but speaks out quite freely. He is not afraid of disgracing himself before other people. He must come out with his faith, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It's though as he meant to say that the God I have been shattered because of my sin, there is nothing else for me now but to believe in you, God, and to cling to your mercy, to implore your grace, otherwise I am ruined. In this way, faith casts itself upon God. It breaks forth and establishes itself through works. When that happens in a man, I can recognize him as a believer and so can others. Do you hear the impact of faith in our hearts? A faith that believes in what God has done for you in Jesus. It's a faith that frees you from this burden of saying, have I ever done enough for God? It's a faith that tells you that God's grace is greater than your sin. So when you have that and know that the only thing left for your faith to do is just want you to joyfully serve God. Like, I can't lose his grace, I can't earn his grace, which means the only thing left for me is to appreciate his grace. And this is what comes then from that realization. Luther says this, The reason why St. Luke and St. James put considerable emphasis on works is to prevent men from laboring under the false delusion that faith is merely some vague sort of feeling that floats about on the heart like froth on beer. 
He was German, all right, we could have, you know. He calls that absolutely wrong to, make your, to have your faith think that it's just something that just floats out there. Faith is a vital, living reality, making a man quite new, changing his whole disposition, giving his life a completely different direction. Faith brings a man right down to the grassroots of existence, and a complete renewal of the whole man takes place. Hence, if I formerly knew a man to be a sinner, I can see from his changed behavior, his altered being, and his different life, that he is now a believer. Faith is always the most important factor. The Holy Spirit has also seen fit to emphasize works because they are witnesses of faith. If there are those who produce no evidence in the form of works, we can quickly conclude they heard the message of faith, but it never penetrated to any depth in their case. So ask yourselves that. You've heard the message of the gospel. You have a faith that says, yep, I believe that God's grace is greater than my sins. You believe and you have heard that you are forgiven through your faith in Jesus' death on the cross for you. Has it penetrated into your heart at all? And I'm not talking about that self-righteous delusion that we get sometimes that says, well, I'm a good Christian. Of course it has. I'm talking about that complete change of character. The complete desire to live as Christ has called us to be a life filled with appreciation for his goodness. When Paul wrote, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He's talking about you having been transformed by your faith now. Like if you have faith but you're still you and that's just how things are, this is how I'm always going to be. Do you really understand God's grace? Has it really changed you and transformed you? Because that almost then sounds like, no, I'm good enough the way I am. It almost sounds like you've deserved God's grace or you've earned God's grace and he just has to deal with it. Remember, in Jesus' parable with the Pharisee and the tax collector, the one who humbled himself before God is the one that Jesus said went down to his house justified. Friends, the humbled heart, the one that is filled with faith in God's grace and his mercy given to us through Jesus' death on the cross, that's the heart that wants nothing to do with who we used to be. That's a heart that wants nothing to do with that sinful self that Jesus had to come die and free us from. We want nothing to do with those character traits or any of the grossness that comes along with the broken human self. Instead, we just want to be that person that has been transformed by our faith. A humbled heart filled with the Holy Spirit because it says, Holy Spirit, I can't do this on my own. I want you in my heart to change me and make me more like you. It is a deep burning love for God and his goodness. And we don't do it out of obligation. We don't do it to earn anything. It's purely out of joy. Like, it almost can't be helped when our heart is filled with the joy and understanding of God's grace. We get this joy in us. We get this burning desire to, to, to have the world know about God's goodness. We seek after our neighbor's welfare. We want to be who God has created us to be in Christ. That's the reason why there's people in such places like Afghanistan. God designed those people to be like on the front line workers for his kingdom. That isn't saying that we all have to like suddenly pack up and start churches in like the most hostile places in the world. God's created some for that. As a matter of fact, if we say, well, I have to go to those places to prove we're suddenly trying to earn God's grace again. The point of this today, my friends, is this. Instead, find that joy that should be inside of you. If it's not there, wonder, God, why don't I feel joy for how good you've been to me? Why don't I feel joy for what you have done for me in Christ? Start seeking and finding that joy that's supposed to come from your faith because that joy will transform your life. It makes you want to become that workmanship that God has created you to be. God, I want to be who you made me to be. That joy is active and it's alive in you. It should fill you with a desire to build up his kingdom. Friend, find the joy that says, I want my life to be transformed by Christ because I love Christ. Just bow your heads in a word of prayer. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, may you fill us with your spirit to tear down all of our walls, all of things that harden our heart, all of our pride. The way we look in a mirror and we just see all the good in us, or how we look out at others and see all the bad in them. Father, remove all of that. Let us come before you like the tax collector that Jesus talked about in true repentance. But Father, he was filled with faith in knowing how good and gracious you are, that he could fall before your feet, before your throne, crying out, he's a sinner, forgive me, knowing then that he is forgiven. For Lord, he who has been forgiven much will love much. Let that be us. Let us find the joy in building up your kingdom, a joy founded because of how good you are, a life filled with the hope, looking forward to the promises made to us through faith in Jesus Christ. This we pray in his name. Amen. Let's rise for our closing hymn, I Stand Amazed. Let us join together now in saying the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, my friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.